Tulobuku, Komrobosho, Glory, Glory, Hallelujah. <laughs> now, if my sermon gets boring tonight, you can it won't offend me if you open it up. That's very detailed. It's. <laughs> Well, glory. Todd's happy again. That means I'm happy. <laughs> he was lost. He just sat there. We thought he started losing weight. We don't know. So, <laughs> No, he ate everything he wanted while you were gone. He had barbecue stuff all the time. Glory. All right, you can be seated. Let's receive our offering. Shall we do that? Say, be seated. You took it literal, huh? <laughs> How's the puppy doing? Is he in a crate right now? Yeah? All right. Well, bedroom's like a big crate. <laughs> oh, come on. You need an envelope? Raise your hand. Number 14 will assist. You know, I think all the ushers should wear numbers. I could, I could flow with that real easy. <laughs> all right, dollar bills in the house, guys. All right, stand up. Let's pray. Pray and write. Pray and write. Well, Jesus said to pray and watch. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your promises over, over our lives and working in our hearts. And you said that if we would give, it would be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Would men give unto our bosom? With the measure we meet, it'll be measured back to us. Thank you for this amazing, wonderful promise. We just activate it now with our giving. Bless your people abundantly, over the top. May it be a season of firsts. And amazing things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. You can't hear them. <laughs> da 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 da. Look at him walk in like John Wayne. Somebody say my name. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a beautiful evening out. Sunshine, a little rain, a little sleet. It's not a foot of snow. It's April. We bind snow. We're done with it. You've had all winter to snow. Well, let's pray. Let's get in the Word. Father, thank you for the privilege of being a liberated believer of the living God. I thank you that your people will walk in the light all the days of their life, and they will have the wisdom of God. They'll know when to turn, when to stop, when to start. Uh, we'll make the right decisions when we need to. I thank you for it, Master. Now bless your people, confirm your word with miracle signs and wonders in our lives, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, give somebody a high five and say, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Did you go pull that song up on uh, Pandora yet? Which one? Oh, no. You don't mess around with Slim? I, I can't do a spoiler. She's got to hear it. She doesn't know. Do you know that song? You don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit in the wind. And you don't pull the mask off the old long ranger. And don't mess around with Jim. Okay, you can be seated. We're going to change the lyrics to you don't mess around with Doki. Okay, you just leave him be. Give him space. <laughs> All right, Proverbs, the 19th chapter. Mm-hmm. 
do do do. Have you found Proverbs 19? Verse 20. Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. Now see, in the society we live in here, that's a threatening statement there. Listen to counsel. It means you might have to listen to somebody else who knows something you don't know. Uh, and you have to receive instruction. That word receive indicates to me that instruction's available, but I have to choose to receive it. Okay? What I want to talk about tonight is how, how you prepare for success. I believe we've got some things coming in our future. Now, bear with me while I read this out of the Amplified Translation. Hear counsel, receive instruction, and accept correction. Hear counsel, receive instruction, and accept correction. That you may be wise in the time to come. This is powerful. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on accept correction. And most, most humans don't like correction, do they? No? And accept correction, that means you're doing it wrong. We need it this way. This is the correct way to do it. Well, I want to do it my way. Well, you're not going to be prepared for your future. You're not going to be prefer, prepared for that next promotion or blessing. So we're not of this world, so we don't have that attitude that we're so fragile. Uh, I can receive instruction. I'll, I have to be honest with you. It took me a while to accept correction. But when somebody that knows what you don't know offers you correction, you, you listen to it. Uh, I told you the story that was, I was in the carpenter apprenticeship program. I was in my second year, and I got on a job. And, and it wasn't uncommon for him to make an apprentice work with one of the older seasoned guys. And there was an old guy named Frank, a grumpy old man. And they thought it would be good if I worked with him. And so I worked with him, and they were correct. He was a grumpy old man. And one of the things we learned at the apprenticeship class was our instructor said, whatever you do, don't go on the job and tell them this is the way they told us to do it at apprenticeship school. Don't do that. That's not going to turn out like you hoped it would. And so anyway, I worked with Frank, and I don't know why I did this, but I kept my mouth shut, and I just did what he told me to do. And I ended up, because hardly anybody could get along with him, I ended up his partner for a long time. And it took a month or two of me just doing what he told me to do. And then he started telling me why I was doing what I was doing which in second year into a four-year you know, apprenticeship program, that bumped me right ahead. Because it's important to know why you do something. I mean, you could be satisfied with just you know, stamping one thing and not knowing what's going on. But this old guy, uh, after a while, he, didn't become, he wasn't grumpy anymore to towards me. I was like a little sponge, just sopping up every little bit of construction advice he could give me. Then when I got done with him, in the beginning of my third year of the apprenticeship, I became a foreman. That's pretty cool. You got paid a little more money, got to bark out orders. But in, in, on my crews, I would never have my crew do something I wouldn't do because we did a lot of big commercial jobs. One day, a semi pulled up with material in it for us. You know what it was? Owens Corning Fiberglass. Oh, that stuff's beautiful. You rub it on there, and it gets in your pores. And, and so usually what you do is you take the lowest two or three guys on the ladder and tell them, buddy, unload that truck. And I didn't do that. I, I said, I'll jump in and help. And then I did it when the truck's loads of drywall would show up and other things needed done. And I gained immediate favor with my crew. They didn't mind working with me. Pretty cool. Because construction guys are kind of funny. They don't like you. You'll probably know about it. They took one guy's lunchbox and they screwed it down to the picnic table. And when the day was over, he went to lift his thing up. And Of course, there happened to be eight of them standing there waiting to see him. And I can't tell you what they said about it. But it was not church. 
It was not family oriented. Hear counsel. Where would you hear counsel at? In church? From the Bible? Yeah, you'd hear counsel there. You hear counsel from fathers, mothers, grandparents, instructors, teachers, somebody that's older than you, boss, if you have a, a regular boss. I mean, there's, there's counsel all kinds of ways. Uh, you know, what's really cool now in 2024, as opposed to in my younger years, we didn't have the internet. So when you had to pursue facts, it was a workout. Now, now you just Google a question and it comes back to you in seconds, and that's kind of what uh, scares me about this generation that has access to a lot of information, but they don't have the wisdom to make it all work. And so God protect you online. Hear counsel. Does that mean you don't have to hear counsel? I, uh, I told the story last week about the benevolent fund we used to have. And we'd make them fill out an application. And uh, I have several of these little stories, uh, but a couple came in and, you know, gave me their spiel. And it wasn't an unreasonable price, but I said, you know what? I'll grant your wish if you come to three services in a row. And the man looked at me and said, I don't need church. I need money. I said, there lies your problem. You need wisdom. Wisdom produces money. And you might be doing something wrong in your life, and the Word will correct you. He never came to the three services. I want money. Well, go find somebody else. He, could, he couldn't make the... They already threw him out of the bank, I think. They already told him, go somewhere else. Go to the, every church because they're rich. They're sitting on piles of money, not knowing what to do with it. Does that sound like too hard of advice? Come to three services in a row... And then we'll see how you are at the end of it. I would have done it. I mean, I'd have probably slept in the back, but I would have done it. Uh, too many options. I guess he said, we'll work somewhere else. We'll, we'll find another church to tell our sad story to. Here, counsel, you can physically come in here and not be tuned in. You know that? It it's two things. It's a self-discipline that when you're here sitting in this, in this atmosphere, that you have to give me your attention, okay? You have to, on purpose, everything that you left outside is still there. It'll be fine. And then the other key to this hearing instruction is there's a hard attitude that you have to have. I mean, coming to church should be a good time to prep yourself by praying in the Spirit, worshiping, having anticipation about something that's going to happen to you when you come in here. Everybody say anticipation. That I'm, I'm going to tell you a funny story. This is a Doc Taylor story. They're the best. But, but Doc and I used to shoot our pistols together. And he asked me if I wanted to go on a wild boar hunt with him. And I thought, like the boars that charge you. And I said, that would be cool. I'll, I would love to spend a week with Doc and be out in that. And it was a ranch that he was going to, and he'd been there before, and he brought me back fruit from the promised land. Glory to God, was that good. But he said the one condition is I had to go shoot my pistol with his, with his pistol shooting guy because you walk around with a rifle, but you have to have a pistol on you because all of a sudden they could come out of nowhere or you could walk up on them. And so for some reason, this this guide wanted to make sure I knew how to make a shot. And so I said, put that quarter on your ear, buddy, and back up a little bit. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> so we, we went out. It was uh, uh, north of Otsego is a little bit. But we go up there and we shoot. We make plans to do it the next week. And in between the, the shooting and the next appointment we had with him, Kevin and I were in Battle Creek, and there's a store called Horrocks. Wonderful store. Anyway, this was before I had my progressive glasses, and so I had my little cheaters that I'd wear. Well, one of the things about Horrocks is they have a candy section. Glory. And, and so I'm, I'm man shopping. I'm not looking at everything. I know what I want. 
I'm not looking for what's on sale. I'm, I, I have one thing. And I reached up and I got, got my little jar of chocolate-covered raisins with the light chocolate. My, those jaw muscles are tightening up right now just thinking about them. I bought those. I brought them home. And because they were special, I put them on the counter and left them there. Then the day came when I went to drive and meet Doc Taylor. I took them with me. I said, the, Doc will love these. I'm going to eat some on the way up. I'm driving up the road. I, I get on I-94, and I pop a couple in my mouth, and it flipped me out because they were chocolate-covered coffee beans. <laughs> but for a week, I had in, been anticipating the chocolate, the raisins. Mm. Mm. And my eyes must have went like this, and my hair stood up, and <laughs> and I thought, oh, my goodness. So I get to the, the place we're shooting with Doc. I tell him my little story. Doc's so gracious, he laughs. And I said, I want to bless you with these coffee beans. And he said, Pastor, you're the best. I love these things. <laughs> so do you think the Lord had me buy those for him? Could that be? I mean, Doc was one happy dude. And just so you know, Doc loved his coffee. Doc made strong coffee. But he liked those coffee beans. But all that to be said, for a week I anticipated putting that raisin in my mouth. And it felt like I put, put a handful of dirt in my mouth eating that coffee bean. If I wasn't such a strong man, I would have started to cry. That's right. I, I'm working on a little box. Hallelujah. All right, counsel. Coming to church, you should be prepared. Okay, you should expect. Nice look, Oliver. He had the snake across his eyes. All right, let's see. Everybody write down, listen to counsel. Here's the victory interpretation of listen to counsel. Hear and obey. It's not the listeners who are blessed. It's the doers. Hear and obey. Listen means to hear intelligently, often with implication of attention and obedience. That means on purpose, right? Counsel means advice given by someone who is wiser or more knowledgeable in a subject. That doesn't sound complicated at all, does it? Advice given by someone who is wiser or more knowledgeable in a subject. Thus, in my life, I'm not confused who to ask for counsel. I can call Dr. Barkley's cell phone, his home phone, Josh's phone, right? I could Google it. Doc knows way more than I do. Okay, got it? I ask somebody who knows what they're doing and has had victory in that area before. And now, this out of the Amplified, hear counsel, receive instruction. You guys all know what instruction is. This is how we do it. Anybody ever got a new job, and uh, somebody was with you and said, this is how we assemble this, this is how we do this, this will cause problems if we do it this way? <laughs> instruction. The average American is haughty and proud, and they don't like too much instruction. Hallelujah. But if you'll stay teachable in your heart, you will receive instruction. He'd be all right. He's, I've assigned him to clean the gum off the bottom of the chairs. And I told him he could take them home. Here, instru receive instruction. Receive instruction. Dr. Summerall told me one of the most dangerous things a Christian can do is act as if they know everything. Always stay teachable. But if you're going to receive instruction, uh, don't, don't um, mix up the message and the messenger. Because God might send somebody across your path, and they might have an accent. They might be short and curt. They might not, not sugarcoat everything like you're used to being pampered. They, they might say it quickly. and Don't get all offended with that. 
Don't get all shook up with that. Okay? I mean, let's face it. Not everybody is as smooth as moi. Oh, no, I've said many things the wrong way. As I've gotten older, I've gotten better. I would say, how would I want to hear this? How would I want one of my kids to hear this? And you can still be stern, but you have to receive instruction. And then with that will also come correction. You have to accept correction. Now, a lot of times we give correction before we give instruction. But it's, it's good to, to know what you're doing, what's expected of you, whatever arena you're in. And then if there's more tweaking that needs to be done, you receive instruction. Have you ever done the best you could do and still it didn't work and you finally had to say, hey, what's this? How come, how come I keep getting this instead of my desired result? And they might tell you something that will challenge your ability to do things. We're, we're kind of resistant to change. Good preaching, Pastor. All right, go to Proverbs 15 then. Now, that's the only verse in the Bible that says anything about receive counsel, instruction, and correction. Glory to God. I'll tell you another cool story that this outline reminds me of is um, 11 years ago. Well, no, it's, not, it's 13 years now. It's in 2011. We completed Nick's barrier-free house. It's a, it's a very cool house. Not one step in it. Uh, it, it. From the outside, the sidewalk just gradually goes up to the door, and same in the garage. And, but in his house, we put a, a little elevator, a five-by-five five elevator. Well, my little grandson, his, one of his uncles works for uh, McNally Elevator Company. And so I, of course, was supervising the job, so I'd be over there all the time, those elevators are quite complicated. They require hydraulics, electrical. I mean, it's, it's quite, a, quite a thing. And, and so two or three different guys would come out, and I would talk with them and hassle them a little bit. And they told me something real interesting. They said, they, McNally used to just install new elevators. And that's good. That'll keep you busy, right? He said, but about four years ago, they extended their contract to service elevators. So that means uh, elevators broke down. They go out there, figure out the problem, repair it, and go. And I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Somebody's got to repair the elevators. I don't want to be stuck in an elevator. And they said, repairing these elevators totally changed the way we installed elevators. We worked much slower, much more methodical, much more detailed, knowing any shortcut, you could be the one coming back out there to fix it. And he said, we weren't doing it wrong the first time. Yeah, we're, we're just doing it better because that's an old construction thing. That I worked on companies where if you did it wrong, they send you back out. Yeah? Are we okay? All right, Proverbs 15, verse 31. <laughs> the ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. Now, that verse is real spiritual, isn't it? The ear. Do I have to be attached to that ear? I said, do I have to be attached to that ear? Do you have to be attached to your ears? The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. All right? I have a note right by, my, by this verse that says, I ask myself this question, what has life taught me? See, you can learn great things in church, but you can also learn things from experience. What has life taught me? Well, first thing life taught me was it's not fair. It'll crush you every chance it gets. I've learned what type of person to trust and what person not to trust. You know how I learned that? I didn't read a book on it. I got stabbed in the back a time or two. And I realized I better be more discreet with what I say to somebody. Okay? Got it? What has life taught you? Anything? You ever met a bad person? Yeah? You ever made a mistake? And it cost you something and you said to yourself, duly noted, I will not do that again. The, the, I don't want to jinx myself. 
So in Jesus' name, I'm just giving this example. As long as I've been driving an automobile, I've only had two tickets. Both were for speeding. Oops. Okay? Don't judge me. I've been driving 40-some years. Never been in an accident. Well, I got hit once, but that's because they went out of the way. Okay? The last ticket I got, Kevin and I had to take Corey to work at Yarrow Golf Course. And that meant we had to cut through the little village of Augusta. You talk about Barney Fife being the sheriff. And so it's, anybody know where Augusta is? So, and I've been told many times, be, pay attention when you go through Augusta. And sure enough, I got popped. And right up the road, you could see where the speed limit went from 25 to 50. And the little chubby, the little chubby sheriff came to the car, and it was like it was the biggest bust of the year. And, and he said, he, he was hiding. And, uh, you know, license, registration, all that stuff. And he tells me, you know, I pulled you over. I said, well, probably because I was going over the speed limit. He says, you're correct. It's 25. I said, the sign right up there says, and he said, that sign is 400 and some feet away. Or he named an exact, just being smart with me, just, just reminding me he was the guy with the badge. And so I, bought the, I paid for the ticket. It's off my license now. But you know what happens every time I through, go through Augusta? Four-way flashers are on. <laughs> I'll never get another speeding ticket in Augusta. In Jesus' name. Okay? Now, receive counsel. You've been warned. Got it? Leadfoot? You drive fast, don't you? No? You're the one who drives fast. She drives fast? Hmm. The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. Anybody ever got lippy with a police officer? Now, some of you already know this story, but when Nick was a senior in high school, he got, he got busted for drinking alcohol in the car at the movie theater with some of his buddies. Somebody saw them, called the police, the police came, and... Everything ensued after that. But Nicholas Anderson had to appear in court. Yeah, and uh, we had a good father-son talk on the way to court that day. I said, you're going to see a man or a woman that's totally different than you. They might be bald, they might be old, they might be tall, they might be short. And uh, they have complete control over what's going to happen. And so you say, yes, Your Honor, no, Your Honor. And if anything foolish comes out of your mouth, you better hope you get sent to jail. Because he doesn't care if you're a jock at Portage Central or any of that. You have to know how to talk to a judge. You do. May you never talk to a judge. We once had a guy in our congregation, he was a little bit psychologically whacked. But he, he told me several times, God told me that you're sending me to the mission field to Malaysia you're going to pay for it and all this. I said, well, cool. When God tells me that, then we'll do it. But you have a hard time coming to church. I, I don't know what you'd do if you get into Malaysia. And uh, finally, it got to the place where he was harassing me. I finally gave him the, the notice, don't come back here. You're not looking for what we're given. And, and uh, he came back again. And, and your Uncle Andrew enjoyed that day. And Wes Baker, and the, these guys were all big and young, and, and, and they carried him out to the parking lot. And they were probably praying for him as they carried him out there. I don't know. And then the sheriff came, and the sheriff told him, he said, you know what? You can save yourself a lot of trouble. Get in your car go. And he said no to the sheriff. And the sheriff tried to move him, and he resisted. And it didn't end up well. He got thrown in the back of that car. Yeah, he wanted his clothes hamper that I sold cocaine out of. He would call the office and say, I'm selling cocaine out of the hamper he left here. Hey, this is not a dull place here. Best part of the story is still coming. 
he, he got put, like, I think 12 days in the psychiatric hospital in Kalamazoo. So I no longer was on his fan club list. He blamed me for it, which... But anyway, I get summoned to court at his whatever event it was, you know. And I haven't been to court too many times, maybe a handful of times. But I go in, I sit, and there's probably 30 or 40 people in there, and you can all tell they're all uncomfortable. The judge isn't at his desk there. And uh, a sheriff comes out from the office and walks up and said, are you Pastor Anderson? I said, I am. He said, the judge would like to see you in his chambers. So when I walked his chambers, I was walking real slow, you know, rabashikai. <laughs> and I got in there, and the guy was there, the violator. And, and Wes and Andrew, and we had another guy named Dan Boot. They, weren't, they were big and strong. They weren't all polished yet. But. So here I'm sitting at the desk across from the judge, and the guy's here, and my three guys are behind me like I felt like the godfather. I felt it was, it was a powerful feeling. And uh, the judge said, once again, I'm going to give you a chance. Pastor Anderson doesn't want you to come to this church. That sounds like an easy request. This whole thing could go away right now. The Pastor Anderson... Are you okay with that? I said, I'm good. They asked me if I was a psychologist. I said, no, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a trained, certified psychologist, even though I think I am one now. And so the judge looked at him, and he called him by name, and he said, my advice to you is don't ever go back to that church. There's hundreds of churches. And this kid leaned forward at the judge and said, I obey no man. I obey Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what my three guys said. You can hear them all go, ooh. And you know what the judge did? He didn't change his facial expression. He leaned forward and hit this button. And two large guys walked through the door. They did, and they picked him up one arm at a piece, and his little feet was dangling. And, and I sat there. I was this far from it. And I thought, this is like TV stuff. I can't wait to tell this story. And apparently... The judge didn't like that happening. So now we have a judge who's ticked off because of us. And I, what I heard, I left, but when I walked out, they all knew something had gone, and the judge came out mad. And I think the first five or six people that stood before him, it didn't go well for him. Judges are human too, you know. So I learned right there, a rebuke of life is never tell a judge. I listen to no man. Yeah, he said, I'm sorry, Reverend, that we had to do this. And then he tried showing up one more time. I'm just telling you. Actually, what we had was Robert Judah Paul was here. And he, he knew our routine. He knew when I'd be pulling in with Robert Paul. But what he didn't know is we changed our routine. And he was greeted in the driveway by... <laughs> by those three big guys again. Church, you know you're going to have good church when the, the devil starts doing stuff like that. I mean, a rebuke of life. Now, I learned, of course, I already had a pretty good grasp on that. When somebody has authority over you, you don't say something like that. Okay, whether you like them or you don't, don't take it personal. They're just, I, here's a rule of thumb I live by. I, did, I try to keep my life out of everybody else's hands. I'm not waiting for a judge to rule on my future. I'm, I'm, okay, that's a good way to live. Okay, karate kid, best block no be there. Right. Hallelujah. So what's life taught you? Don't be stupid. <laughs> Anybody in here ever, I don't know, you guys have never been to the principal's office. Uh, you have, I know that. Kevy was, but that was for talking too much. You skip school? Oh. It was raining. Was... Oh, so it's justified. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Okay, 
Receive instruction, the New American Standard says, accept discipline. Now, this verse is powerful. It's, it, it tells a lot here. The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. Do you know this? I'm one of four sons. I'm number three in the list. And I learned from every mistake my older brothers made. Doesn't mean I didn't get caught doing it my way. I just didn't do it the way they got caught. Hey, that's how you get wisdom. You pay attention to who's gone before you. Okay? The, the, the rebukes of life. That's kind of a weird phrase. It's not all spiritual, but you can learn. Now, when my mama was alive, she was a sports fanatic, and she had a house full of kids. I mean, even after we moved out, grandkids and all this. In the back of her little SUV, she had a box. And in that box was a blanket, a pad to sit on, an AM, FM transistor radio, binoculars, umbrella, gloves, hat. You know what that, that was in that box? You know why that box was there? Because you go to, go to a track meet in April in Michigan. Go to a ball game or a softball game in April or May. They could be shoving the baseline off with snow. And so my mom always had this little emergency kit in the back of her vehicle. And you know how she learned that. She didn't read it in a book. She sat in the bleachers and said, I'm cold. I don't like being cold. Okay? And here's the, here's the thought. I learned this from construction. If you're going to be outside in this weird weather, it's better to have too many layers on because it's easier to take a layer off than to chiver like a little chihuahua. All right, how about if I say it this way? Nothing wrong with mistakes, but learn from your mistakes. Hear that? Learn from your mistakes. You'd, you would be amazed at some of the uh, successful people who did boneheaded things. They might not talk about it, but in here, they know what works and what doesn't work. It's pretty cool. Do you remember our, our guest, uh, our, our friend from... Uh, Oh, Fort Worth, but he was from Atlanta. Uh, Mylon Lefevre, the singer. He was the lead singer for Atlanta Rhythm Section. Then he got saved and born again and spirit-filled. And good friend, uh, real good friend of ours. He, uh, <laughs> he came and preached one time. We are having a little, a, a little meeting we had, Mylon and Dr. Barkley, and we were in that little church in Parchman. And I'm, you drove the car. Yeah, you drove Doc's Cadillac and hit a curb or something because they were talking about it. You couldn't get it to start. And Doc Barkley leaned over and said, let me help you, kid. It was pretty funny. And so a lot of memories coming. Anyway, we have church, great service. I'm still very intimidated by the doctor. And Mylon's this old hippie. It's really easy to get along with, but we sit down. Remember I told you the Dr. Summerall story where he said a pot pie sounds good? Well, we didn't take these guys out to dinner. We had a dinner prepared to eat there at the church. That's good. They liked it. I didn't know about this. I wasn't involved in the table setting project. But when we sat down and opened up our napkins, they were like two foot by two foot. And Mylon said to Doc, what is this, sir? Doc said, just go with it. You know what it was? They came out of our nursery. They were the little pads you put a baby on to change your diapers. <laughs> you know, that's only happened once. <laughs> I'm kidding you not. Doc Barkley told Mila, just go with it. It's a young church. They don't know. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Hey, but it wiped up every bit of juice and everything there was. It's only happened once, and I can guarantee it will never happen again. Got it? That's hilarious. I learned something that day. Yeah. The, the last time Josh was with us, we took him to, he's a big fan of Carabas. And in Kevy's purse, 
Somewhere in her purse, she has a little Swiss army knife that's pink. And she uses it for everything. It's got the sharpest scissors on it. I caught her the other day cutting one of her fingernails. But anyway, she, was, she had something and it had a price tag on it. She pulled out her little knife and she tried to cut it. And Josh said, give me that knife before you cut yourself. Did he? And then he looked like a ninja when he got the knife. So mistakes aren't the end of the world. Learn from them, okay? In the way you talk. How, how about this? Anybody ever had to go to an interview? Those are always nerving. And sometimes what happens is you don't get the job. And so, I, listen, I'm speaking from experience as a pastor. As I've had people pray for me. I'm using you as a reference. I can do all of that, but you still have to go one interview, two interviews, and you don't get the job. That doesn't mean you're, you're a misfit. I just say, you know, if you can master the interview process, you'll be all right. I, actually, I know some people who are not as qualified as other people could have been, but they did better in the interview. Because I heard one management person say to the other, where's the guy we interviewed? This guy seems different. But he, but he nailed the interview. He learned from his mistakes. Because you can ask him, is there a reason why you don't? I'm not fit for the job? I mean, there might be an area that they see about you that you don't see about yourself. The rebukes of life. Got it? Have you ever had one? Tell me one of yours. Huh. Hmm. Did you ever say anything that ticked your sister off? And did you say it again, or did you say, no, we're not going near that field? Um, oh. <laughs> S- S-P-A. No, I've, I've heard some good stuff. <laughs> for sure. See all the remorse on her when she's saying that? Oh, that's right. You were the little uh, instigator type. And, and Rachel was just perfect. Like and... I started something here. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. What's life taught you? I, I heard a saying just the other day that was really cool about life. He said, you better... the." The statement was, you can't stay bad, off, weak, sick all the time because life won't stop for you. It won't wait for you to be fully recovered. You have to keep moving. Pretty interesting. I might nail that down a little better next time I say it. Go to the 13th chapter. We're almost done, hallelujah. I learned that after I preach an hour and 15 minutes, people get sleepy. Let's see here. All right, what do we learn in here? Hear counsel, receive instruction, accept correction. The ears that hear the t- lessons of life. Isn't that a term they use out in the world, life lessons? I know uh, this is a funny story, but Kev's, the men in Kev's family, every deer season, they go up to Drummond Island and they deer hunt. Uncle Jim passed away one year, and they needed one body. And so they volunteered me to go deer hunting on that island. Five-hour drive, two of Kevy's brother, a brother-in-law, Kevy's dad. And I'm I'm not much of a deer hunter. You know, I specialize in bear hunting, but (laughs) deer hunting's not as exciting. Um, And I teased Kevy before. She said, oh, I'm so happy that you're going with my brothers. And I said, I got a bad feeling about it. They might be taking me out in the woods and whack me. <laughs> and that got her feisty. She said, my brothers love you. <laughs> but the first, I've never gone deer hunting. I've never been to deer camp. So I took some thermal socks, some boots, long underwear. And by the time that week of camping up there was over, I had a little punch list of stuff I never thought to bring. And so each year, that list, I, I, now I'm just this expert traveler right down to whatever I need. Uh, I will confess to you, I do not overpack, okay? And I'm on Drummond Island. That means you can wear something two or three times, and nobody will know 
Um, I'm going to get in trouble, but it'll be fun. When I take Kev when we travel, she overpacks. That's not. <laughs> I'll throw in black pair of shoes, black pants, and a shirt that will go with, you know, shirts that will go with all that. And I'm, I'm packed in five minutes. I know what everything. And Kevy, Kevy packs for just in case. Because I can't say for all women, but women kind of dress according to their mood. Okay. I'll leave it with, is that good? I'm not insulting anybody, but. So I don't get up in the morning and say, Kev, you wear this. And I don't buy her clothes either. I'll go with her and pay for them, but I won't bring home something and she'll say, really? So, but in our conversation, Kevy packed the way she normally does, like she's going to be there a month. And Listen. When we got home and we're unpacking, she's got a whole section in her suitcase that hasn't been touched. And I had to be me. I told you so. <laughs> you don't need to do this. She still does it. And she still buys stuff while she's out there, too. She's got enough, but she got to find something that, you know, and oh, well, enough about my... Tr- Oh, it's a bad story. You'll be all right, Oliver. Don't whoop him too hard, Rachel. No, he doesn't get whooped? Have you found 13? Or you want me to tell you more Kevy stories? <laughs> Verse 13. He who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. That's crazy, isn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I'm reading the wrong verse. Verse 18. I even though that was a good one too. Poverty. Everybody like poverty? And shame. Can you imagine those two go together? Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he who... But he who regards a rebuke will be honored. See, the modern church is terrified of rebuke. Now, I I get it. Sometimes the rebuke is done harshly or in a way that could be better. I heard Doc Barkley say this one time. He said, the young Marine preacher said it one way, but after all these years, I'm much better at saying it now. That made a lot of sense. Because you you should be improving in, in whatever you're doing. I've been on a theme lately. What the, the younger Scott Anderson would have done that and paid a price for it. The older Scott Anderson thinks him through a little bit. Yeah, it was like uh, we watched a lady that had a little kid, and the little kid was all hyper, and she kept trying to grab him. And I, I thought, she's going to grab this, and it's gonna, she's going to say, what do I do with the bobcat now that I've caught it? Because you can't shake it off. It's all on you. So he learned, don't pick up the bobcat. <laughs> okay? Did you hear there was a red wolf shot in Calhoun County? That's amazing. It was a red wolf. Wed wolf. A wed, wed wolf. All right, let me keep reading here. Poverty and shame come to him who refuses instruction and correction. But he who heeds reproof is honored. Now that, that, that's getting a strong warning in there if I become stiff-necked and refuse instruction and correction. I'll get a reward. It's not what I want. Isn't that amazing? So that means right there, accept the correction, be willing to change. Do you hear me? Be willing to change. Make the changes for the right reasons, not because somebody made you. Make the, make the change in your life for the right reason. Improve and keep expanding. Learn and grow. Ask questions. Okay. <laughs> Got it? Here we go. Here's to the American church. Stop blaming somebody else. Quit accusing somebody and quit making excuses. 
Let me say it again. Stop blaming. Get out of that victim thing. Stop blaming. Stop accusing. And quit making excuses. And uh, God will work in you powerfully. Amen. The reward, according to that verse, first verse I gave you in Proverbs 19, the, the reward will be in your future, you'll be wise. I, ha I have a, a earth-shaking revelation to give you. Life doesn't get easier as you get older. It gets harder. Amen. Amen. Now, I didn't say that in a cursed way or, you know, I, because life's so hard on me. I'm just, it's been my discovery that you, you better stay in fight mode all the way, in, in fight and faith mode. Hallelujah. The changes you make today might not be about today. They could be about your future. Could be about your children's future. Amen. David killed a lion. David killed a bear. I'd have been satisfied with a lion. There would have been a, there would have been a mount there. Then, then what's the third thing he killed that's recorded? A giant. A big, stinky giant. Write this verse down. Matthew 25, 21, Jesus said, If you're faithful over a few things, you'll be a ruler over many things. So wherever you're at today is a classroom. Don't be afraid to ask questions or say, can I do that better? Are you good with this? Okay? All right, close your Bibles. That's an instruction. Are you typing notes or are you texting? I'm typing notes. Typing notes. Okay, stand up. Hallelujah. Father, thank you so much for leading us by your spirit and by your word of truth. I pray that every person in here receive the anointing and spirit of this word, knowing that you're not mad at us or working against us. You're preparing us for success. In Jesus' name, I bless your people. Amen, amen. and amen. Well, Kevin, I love you. We believe in you. Grace and peace be with you. And have a blessed rest of the week.